Hi guys, James at Rampant Lion Reviews again for you today with another beer review. For this one, we are going to head down to Belgium once again for the first time in what feels like a good little while. So we're going to return to a brewery that has featured on the channel once before, albeit that was a good few years ago now. The channel's over nine years old at this point in time, which is crazy to think. This is still a hobby that just got out of hand. But um, yeah, this brewery, until very recently, belonged to a group of special breweries that you will no doubt have heard of. We'll come to that in a minute. But it's also a style of beer that I very much enjoy and one that I don't get to review all that often on the channel. And it's quite different from the last one we had from these guys as well, actually. So needless to say, I'm very curious to see what this one is going to have in store for us. Hopefully it's another good beer. Hopefully it makes for an interesting review. And as always, I hope that you guys enjoy my take on this one as well. So uh, yeah, for this review then, we are going to go to a little village called Achel, which is in the Limburg region of Flanders in Belgium. It's kind of in the northeast of the country, almost right on the border with the Netherlands. But we're going to return to Brauerei der Trappisten Abde de Achel, if that is still the, uh, the company's full name, if you like. But regardless, we're going to try one of the Trappist Achel beers. This one is the Blonde 8 and stylistic we would describe this one as a Belgian Abbey Blonde, I guess we could say, but at 8% ABV, this one is not far off from uh, the, the strength you'd expect of a triple, actually. So yeah, let's just see how we got on with this one. But the last beer we tried from uh, Achel was the Bruin 8, and yeah, we still need to try the stronger ones as well, actually, because they do have ones that I think are 9.5%, if memory serves me correctly. But uh, yeah, as I said, very curious to see what it's going to have in store for us. Let's crack on with it and see what we've got. So, as always with my reviews then, I'll tell you a little bit about the brewery and in this case the Abbey as well that's associated with it. Uh, if you want to get straight to the tasting, just fast forward. All the usual links are in the video description below. That's the brewery website, the link to my other reviews that I've done from Trappist Achel before, and we will see about adding more reviews to that in the near future. But there's all the usual social media down there. If you want to see more reviews, do please consider subscribing to the channel. The support you give is massively appreciated. And if you go into the channel homepage, you can search for things based on geography. The whole channel has a geography-based tagging system, and uh, you can go into the homepage and search for beer, you know, country, city, state, county, province, pre or whatever you like and you can of course check out the playlist of beers from different countries and you'll find this one in the Belgian playlist. We'll need to make a Trappist playlist as well I guess actually for these beers. But yeah, let's go on to my brewery notes then and tell you a little bit about the history of Achel. So <clears throat> The Trappist Brewery of, or the Trappist Abbey of Achel is based in the town of Achel in the Campion region of Limburg province in Flanders in Belgium. Like I said, it's kind of in the northeastish part of the country, right on the border with the Netherlands. But the Abbey belongs to the Cistercians of Strict Observance and their history goes back quite a long way. So at the end of the 80 Years War, which was 1568 to 1648, the Treaty of Münster was signed between Spain and the Netherlands, with one of the clauses being that the Catholic Mass was not permitted in the Dutch Republic. So the Catholics from Valkensvaard and Schaft built an abbey in Achel, which was at the time part of the Bishopdom of Liège. Now the roots of the abbey trace back to 1686 when Petrus van Einaten founded a community of hermits of St Joseph. But the community grew until 1789 when the French Revolutionary Army invaded the Austrian Netherlands and the abbey was then sold to Jen Diederich van Tuyl van uh, Seruskirchen, if I've pronounced that correctly. Again, apologies for any bad pronunciations in this video, uh, but Dutch is, you know, Flemish is quite a difficult language, of course. Uh, in March of 1846, Monks from the Vesmala Abbey founded a priory in Achel as a continuation of one they had founded in Mirzel Drief back in 1838. So the Abbey and its 95 hectares of land had been bought by the, by the priest Gast from Heze in 1845 and the first beer was brewed on this site in 1852, but the priory was uh, ascended to the status of Abbey, uh, Abbey in 1871, and the beer brewing became a regular activity, but they were also known for cattle breeding as well, apparently. Um, over the coming years, several daughter houses were also founded, including the Rochefort Abbey. But at the beginning of the First World War in 1914, the monks left the Abbey, and then in 1917, the Germans dismantled the brewery to 
salvage the copper. But after the Second World War, a new abbey was constructed between 1946 and 52, but only two of the planned four wings were actually completed. Fast forward to 1989 and the Abbey actually sold most of its land to the National Forest Administration and the Flemish government. But in 1998, the trappers from Vesmala and Rochefort assisted the Achel Abbey to return to brewing because it had stopped quite a bit prior to that. And the new beers were first released in 2001. And this is where, uh, th this is the current form, I guess you could say, of the, uh, the Achel beers. But they continued to do quite well over the following years. But since January of 2021, this abbey is no longer part of the official Trappist Association because the last of the monks retired. And so the beers are now described officially as Trappist style. But under the, the range or under the banner of Trappist Achel, um, you have the, until 2017, you had the Blonde 5 and the Bruin 5. Um, there is still the Blonde 8 and the Bruin 8. And they also have the extra blonde 9.5 and the extra brewing 9.5 as well. So yeah, basically these guys do brown and blonde beers at different strengths. Uh, there was originally 5%, there is 8% and there is now 9.5%. So um, yeah, it's quite interesting actually. I should have tried to get a hold of some of the 5% ones back when we first reviewed uh, beers from this brewery. I think it would have been about 2017 or so that I actually first tried. <clears throat> The, be the Belgian Trappist beers, or since I first tried one from Achel actually, because they were always a bit more difficult to get the Achel ones from what I remember. But um, yeah, that is all I can really tell you about the Achel Abbey and Brewery for the moment. If you want to learn more, of course, you can check out the brewery website. You can follow them on Facebook and Instagram to keep up to date with all the latest goings on. And uh, yeah, you can check out the untapped page to learn a little bit more about the different beers that they've done. But usually when it comes to these old Trappist breweries, they've got quite extensive selections, uh, quite extensive uh, data and stuff on their beer in the websites. So um, yeah, let's crack on then and have a little look at the beer itself. So uh, as you can see, the artwork on this one is kind of what we've seen from Achel in the past. It's quite straightforward, of course. It doesn't have the official Trappist symbol on it anymore, as you can see, but a uh, plain white bottle cap on this one. Um, as we said here, oh, it's actually written in Swedish on the back. That's kind of interesting. So it says this Trappist beer, um, with secondary yeasting uh, fermentation basically in the flask is brewed in the uh, abbey based in the uh, first hand raw raw uh so that yeah and it's just talking about yeah the and it's brewed with the um all these ingredients of course but yeah um as we said an eight percent belgian abbey blonde if you like not far away from the strength of a triple, although the 9.5% one they have is probably more, that's probably more like a triple actually. But yeah, as we said, this beer is known as the Achel Blonde 8 or Blonde 8, I guess they would say. Let's get this guy out and we'll get on with the tasting. Very curious to try my first Achel beer in a number of years. And as I say, it's not that often that I get to review uh, Belgian Blondes, although strangely enough, I do have another one. That I'll be reviewing at some point shortly. But as, as always with the Belgian beers, when you've got the secondary fermentation in the bottle, you need to be careful when you pour these, otherwise you're just going to get a mountain of foam. And you can see already we are getting quite a wee bit with this one. So we'll just continue to pour it slowly. And that should be good. The other thing to remember is that with uh, Belgian beers, they very often put... Um, they very often put like... Um, some candy sugar or something like that in these beers. So that's one of the reasons why Belgian beers are quite high in alcohol, but their mouthfeel is not quite as thick as beers from other countries that have the same alcohol content. Say, for example, if you've got a quadruple, quite often it feels lighter in its mouthfeel than an imperial stout would because obviously they don't have, they don't contain the same amount or they don't start with the same amount of malt. A lot of the alcohol comes from candy sugar that's added into the beer. But um, yeah. As I say, this one does look very, very nice, actually. So uh, it's kind of poured, as you would expect, from a Belgian blonde beer. So we can see that there is um, there is about a finger and a half of a frothy, uh, I would say, almost perfect white head on this one. The bubbles are actually quite beautiful, I have to say. Just look at this. Bring it in and let you see. A nice mix of kind of small and medium-sized bubbles. There are one or two bigger ones throughout the head, of course. 
But in terms of the colour of this beer, this one's got a very lovely kind of rich uh, golden straw type colour to it. Uh, one or two big bubbles sticking toward the side of the glass then, but a few, quite a few little ones going up toward the bottom of the head in this beer, which is to be expected when it's a, a Belgian beer, of course. These beers are a little bit more active, should we say. Um, <clears throat> yeah, but certainly looks very, very good, actually. So, um, remember, the colour of your beer depends on a few things. One, the type of malts that you use. This will go a long way to determining your EBC rating. Two, the length of your wort boil is also going to play a role because the longer you boil the wort, the more the sugars caramelise and thus you get a darker colour of beer. Any barrel aging that you do or any adjuncts that you put in will uh, affect the colour of the beer as well. But normally when it comes to Belgian blondes, you don't have to care about that so much. Although if theoretically speaking, the sugar that they put into these beers can affect uh, the colour of it too. You can see it's got a nice little bit of a natural hazy kind of quality to it, but it will just be due to the fact that it's most likely unfiltered. So um, yeah, I think appearance wise, we don't need to say anything more about it. We can move on and have a wee look at the aroma then. So let's do this. That is pretty nice, I have to say. Yeah, aroma wise, this beer, it gives you kind of everything you would expect actually. It's been a long time since I've had a proper Belgian blonde. One of my kind of go-to beers in honesty is Leffe, but a lot of people tell me that Leffe doesn't taste the same as it used to. Um, but yeah, I used to love a good, uh, a, little, a big bottle of Leffe. It's always quite a nice just session beer for an evening actually. But I always enjoyed as well, you know, the kind of Belgian table beers. Low ABV, but always kind of packed with flavour. Um, but yeah, this one is very nice. You get that typical kind of big Belgian yeasty quality. For me, whenever I think of Belgian beers, I always think of kind of a nice big yeastiness. But yeah, you've got a nice bit of breadiness to it as well, a little bit of sweetness. And you've also got that wee bit of, um, yeah, you've also just got that nice little bit of fruity character to it as well. Uh, lovely smelling beer, this one. So let's kind of break that down and describe it for you a little bit more in depth. So in terms of the the kind of malty side of this beer then. The backbone, you've got a little bit of that kind of fresh, white bready bread crust, of course. It smells a little bit almost like flowery, if that makes sense. But yeah, definitely some bread crust in there. You've got a nice, um, you do have a nice little bit of, um, you definitely have a nice little bit of, I would say, um, kind of straight up white bread in there. So it's like a fluffy kind of fresh, white bread character that's in there so yeah bread crust thicker white bread and then on top of that yeah on top of that you do have some really nice um on top of that yeah you do have some really nice um kind of brown sugary notes as well so yeah fresh white a fresh kind of hedgehog roll bread crust some smooth white bread in there then on top of that you're getting the kind of syrupy uh, notes actually. There is a little bit of, um, at the back of the nose you start to get the yeasty esters out of this one. It has got a wee touch of a kind of farmhousey sort of note to it, but at the same time you're getting that kind of dried apricot and very slightly banana type quality out of the beer as well. So yeah, definitely some of that in the back of the nose. Dried apricots, a little bit of banana, and as I said, you get a little bit of, you, you get a wee bit of a kind of there is maybe a little touch of like a straight up caramel, but it's more of a kind of honey type quality, like a, or a honeycomb maybe is a better way to describe it. So a little bit of that in the middle of the nose. You've also got a wee touch of McVitie's digestive biscuit as well. And um, yeah. Yeah, so a wee bit of honeycomb, a little bit of McVitie's digestive biscuit. As I say, all of that sits on top of that nice kind of white bready base with a bit of bread crust underneath. You've also got the nice... Um, yeasty sort of things um you've also got the nice yeasty sort of things in there as well as i say a little bit of that kind of um you know more thick doughy bready kind of quality but you've also got that little bit of apricot and banana quality from that as well in there um maybe one or two very slightly woody and crackery qualities in that malt base as well other than that i don't know if there's too much to say about the, the kind of malty and yeasty side of the beer. I think we'll get a bit more complexity out of it when we actually taste it though. But on the hoppy side of things, it is kind of um, it is kind of what you would expect. Um, 
and then I would say when it comes to the hoppy side, it's a bit of a curious to know, but I think it, it smells like kind of noble hops, this one, to be honest with you. And Belgian beers tend to, um, quite a few of them use Czech hops, actually, from what I've seen. Uh, they'll use Czech sats and things, but the Belgians produce their own hops, of course. But to me, you get a little touch of earthiness in this beer, but you have a little bit of herbal quality as well. For me, Belgian hops tend to have a wee bit of earthiness and a wee bit of herbal quality, but also the German noble characteristics. So yeah, a little bit of earthiness, a little bit of herbal quality. Also some nice kind of floral notes in there and you have that, um, you've also got that nice little bit of grassiness in there. So the green component for me is actually slightly wet and oily in this case, a bit of wet, freshly cut grass and also that little bit of um, floral quality as well. But um, yeah, aroma wise, on the green side of things, it adds another little bit of it does add another little bit of uh, complexity to the beer. When it comes to the fruity side of the hops, now for me this beer has quite a lot of an oily kind of peary quality to it. There's certainly some of that apricotty uh, quality as well. So yeah, apricot, oily pear, and then a more kind of bright green apple sort of thing uh, coming out of this one too. So yeah, the way that that goes together is very, very nice. Um, Yeah, the aroma that this beer has, I think, is um, is pretty damn awesome in that sense. It's been a good while, as I say, since I've had like a proper Belgian blonde. Um, so yeah, this is quite nice. I mean, at the pub that I work in, we do get quite a few from uh, oh, what's the um, Brasserie de la Seine. Uh, but it's been a while since we've had like a more old school straight up blonde. Obviously, Brasserie de la Seine do a lot of um really interesting beers. It's a brewery that I do need to review on the channel a little bit more actually. But yeah, this one is like kind of more old school. So yeah, this is uh, this is pretty cool, I have to say. Yeah, aroma wise, I think this beer is pretty, it's, it's very, very nice actually. It's getting me thirsty. So as I always say, take a wee bit of time to enjoy the aroma of the beers before you get stuck into them. But we're going to taste this one now. Um, yeah, nothing unusual about this one, but just very nice in terms of its aroma. So this one is the Achel Blonde 8, or Achel Blonde 8, whatever we're going to say, an 8% Belgian Abbey Blonde from the uh, Trappist Abbey of Achel in uh, the, in Belgium. So yeah, let's get stuck into this one. Slange, Skoll, cheers, prost, santé. Yeah, pretty damn solid actually. Um, yeah, the, the thing I've always found interesting with these blondes is when you first take them in, they take a wee while and then they really start to open up actually. Um, but yeah, this is a lovely, just kind of quite drinkable blonde beer. We say it's drinkable at 8% ABV, but you know, that's Belgian beer for you. So, yeah, this one for me is really quite nice. I actually can't remember the um, the, the broom beer that we had from these guys. So, like I say, I will need to get the, the two stronger ones, the, the 9.5 Blonde and Broom. We'll see about that, actually. But this is just really nice and kind of easy going in a sense. Um, still feels strange to say that about an 8%er, but there we are. Um, but yeah, this beer, it, it's one of these ones, it kind of meets all your expectations for the style. This is a style that I do know fairly well, even though I don't review all that many of them. But yeah, um, it gives you everything you would want from this style, actually. But for me, it's actually a very smooth beer, this one, and it's wetter. And the other thing that's catching me about this is that it doesn't, It this kind of shows me that, you know, your palate is always changing. Because I don't find these beers anywhere, this beer, anywhere near as heavy as I would have a couple of years ago. But it just goes to show you how the, the, the craft beer industry is kind of marching forward, if you like. So, yeah. So, in terms of the... Um, in terms of the, the multi-back one of this one, then we'll go through the beer, as we always do. But generally speaking, this one's very smooth, kind of has a bit of slickness to it wee bit hoppy character you know you've just got that little bit of oily fruity note but yeah this one is this beer based it's one of these ones that kind of matches its aroma uh pretty well in terms of its flavor so 
middle third of your palate then let's focus on that the backbone of the beer is absolutely that little bit of fresh white bread bread crust that's forming the, the base of your beer on top of that you've got a bit of fresh white bread in there which i think again goes together quite well so nice fresh white bread um that's the backbone of the beer perhaps actually in between the kind of bread crust and the white bread you've got a little bit of kind of jacob's cream cracker as well So yeah, there's a little bit, say bread crust, a little bit of Jacob's cream cracker, and a wee bit of white bread. Um, on top of that, you start to get some of the kind of brown sugary elements in there. Um, and it's kind of interesting with this one because it's almost like quite slick in that sense. Um, so on top of the white bread, you start to get this, there's like this little oily circle that kind of sits in the middle of your palate and if you go to the dead center of your palate you get this kind of concentrated brown sugary note well not brown sugary note more of a kind of do we describe it as a brown sugar but you do get this quite concentrated sugary note there and that of course is the alcohol in the beer and as you move further out from that it gives you a very slight butterscotch and it also gives you a very slight kind of McVitie's digestive biscuity uh, note so yeah I do like how this goes together So yeah, in the dead centre, a little bit of that concentrated kind of alcoholic brown sugar as you move out from that, a wee bit more butterscotchy, and you also have a little bit more kind of McVitie's digestive biscuity character coming out of this as well. Um, so yeah, you can feel that biscuity note as you move further out toward the edge of the palate there, but it's actually quite um, kind of straight shooting in the middle of the palate. Perhaps toward the front of that middle third of your palate, you'll get a little touch of a you get you you know you could say you get a little touch of woody character but as you move further back that's when you're going to get the yeasty notes um so yeah on the in that sense it does go together pretty well um actually so yeah let's focus on the back i think we've said everything we need to about the middle third of the palette let's go to the back third of the palette then so the border region between middle and back third of your palette again you get a little bit of a bready build up in this one you can feel that there and the base the base of the back third of your palate, you have a little bit more of a kind of fresh bread, bread crusty sort of thing to it. So I do quite like that. Um, yeah, so nice little bit of fresh, um, kind of brown bread, bread crust in there. On top of that, you've got the white bread again, and it feels like a little bit, it's interesting because that layer feels taller and it's also a bit more dense. And then above that, you act, well actually, you've got the bread crust. There's almost a little bit of a slightly wholemeal brown bready character. Then you've got the dense white bread. And then above that, you've got the more kind of yeasty notes coming out of uh, coming out of the beer. And the yeasty character in this one is quite interesting. It's that typical kind of thicker, doughy, bready, yeasty kind of quality that you expect of the Belgian beer. So it's got a little bit of an almost kind of slightly peppery note to it. You've got that big, dense, white bready dough. And you've also got the little bits of kind of banana and dried apricot flavour coming out of it too. And of course, that sits on top of everything on the back third of the palate. But absolutely, you can feel that the flavour in this beer, you can feel that the flavour in this beer at the back third of the palate is a lot taller. Then as you come further forward, it just squashes together that little bit more and kind of condenses down. So yeah, I do like how this... Um, I do like how this beer goes together from that perspective. Uh, yeah. Um, but as I say, it is very nice. Um, I do really like how this, how the beer goes together in that, um, in that sense. Um, I think we've covered everything we need to say about the malty and yeasty side of it, so we can move on to the hoppy side of the beer. I would say. Um, so, back corners of the palate, you do have a nice little bit of earthiness there. Absolutely. And that gets a wee bit more bitter the further into the aftertaste you go. But as you move further forward, there's a little bit of herbal character in there. And as you push further forward toward the uh, the kind of front of the corners of the palate, you've got a little bit more of a kind of floral, aromatic quality to this beer as well, which again, I 
very much like. Um, yeah, so see a little bit of herbal, a little bit of floral aromatic, then a bit of a lighter grassiness in there too. But yeah, it does go together uh, very, very nicely for sure. Uh, yeah, not much else we need to say about the hoppy side of the beer. It doesn't feel that bitter, it just more adds a little bit of freshness to it. But let's look at the front third of your palate then and just see how you go or how we go with this. So border region between front third and middle third of your palate. Again, you get a little bit of a, uh, again, you get a little bit of a kind of bready build up in this one. So you feel it's sort of white bready and the base of your front third of your palate, the base of your front third of the palate is more uh, kind of smooth and white bready as well. But on top of that, you've got that nice little bit of um, oily fruitiness as well, which is great. Um, so on top of that, I would say the fruitiness is quite interesting because it is it is actually quite light. This whole beer feels kind of wet, but we'll come back to that when we talk about the mouthfeel. But the fruity side of this is quite interesting. So let's just focus on that as I say. Um, so at the back of the front third of your palate, you've got the kind of base of that is like a sort of dried apricot quality. Yeah, I would stick with that, dried apricot, but on top of that, you do get a wee touch of a, <coughs> pardon me, getting a bit of a gas out of this beer. Always happens to me with Belgian beers, just because, you know, they've always got more carbonation and stuff. But yeah, the the on the base of that, you've got a little bit of that more apricot-y type quality. Then you start to get the, um, yes, yeah, so you've got a little bit of that more dried apricot-y sort of thing. You have... A kind of sultana type quality on top of that you know dried white green grapey notes so definitely got that in there as you move further forward yeah as you move further forward from that um it does become yeah you, as i say you get the dried apricot you start to get a more kind of oily peary note in the middle uh, of that front third of your palate and as you reach the kind of front edge of your tongue you start to get a little bit more of a kind of fresh green apple or a very slightly I don't know if we could say lime, it's got like a fresh green apple, maybe slightly gooseberry type note, and the green apple kind of mixes in with the grassy esters on the front tip of your tongue. I think that's definitely fair to say. So yeah, dried apricot kind of forming the base of that fruity side of your palate, a little bit of sultana on top, some oily pear, some fresh green apple, and a wee bit of gooseberry sitting uh, kind of underneath it. So yeah, the way that that goes together, I think is very, very nice. But yeah, a nice beer this one, and as I say, it gets a thumbs up from me. So um, yeah, I like this. I do like this one. Um, in terms of the yeah, in terms of the uh, the mouthfeel, then I think we can round off the beer with this. For me, this beer, it's actually for an eight percenter. It's actually one of the kind of lighter Belgian ones that I've come across. But at the same time, I always have to remember that my palate is changing. Like. I don't find Hefeweizen's thick anymore, and I always used to back in the day. It's kind of the same with these. But yeah, um, for me, it's kind of right in the middle of the spectrum. So mid-bodied, I would say. Carbonation is a little bit crisp, crisp in this one, but it mainly quite smooth. And overall, the mouthfeel for me is quite wet, but it has a degree of slickness too. In terms of IBUs, I would say that this beer is roughly about 20 IBUs, I would definitely say that, yeah, roughly about 20 IBUs. Uh, the malt base is quite smooth, but also quite sweet. And um, yeah, the fruitiness for me is a little bit oily, which I do quite enjoy as well. Uh, but yeah, it gets a big thumbs up from me, this beer in, 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 those, in, in terms of its flavour profile. And I think it's just, it's a really nice kind of strong Belgian blonde actually. Kind of, as I say, halfway between Leffe and halfway between West Mallet, it's kind of, it really is somewhere in the middle of this. So I'd be curious to try the slightly stronger one and see um, about, you know, see if that has a wee bit more sweetness and things like that. I do like a little bit more sweetness in the Belgian Blonde than this beer kind of gives you. This one is a little bit more kind of bready leaning and a little bit drier in a sense, but still a very, very nice beer. So yeah, I think that's everything we need to say about this one. So this one was the Blonde 8, Blonde 8, whatever we're going to call it from the Trappist Achel range, from the uh, Brauerei der Trappisten Abdi.
the Acho, if we're giving it its full name. So yeah, I think we can leave it at that for this one. Once again, thank you for watching my beer reviews. Until the next time, please like, subscribe, share, all the usual YouTube stuff. Let me know your own thoughts on this beer in the comment section below. Let me know what your favourite beers are from Trappist Acho as well. And we will no doubt return to this brewery at some point fairly soon. I don't plan on leaving it years again before we try something from these guys. So yeah, thank you again for watching. Check out my social media. Check out their social media. Go and visit the Abbey if you get the chance. But yeah, I'll see you guys in another review. Slanja, Skull, cheers. See you very soon.